all the debt warriors listening and welcome back to another episode of Millennial Debt Domination. I'm your host, Katie Vada. The month of June highlights National Home Ownership Month. This month promotes the benefits of home ownership and creates opportunities for future homeowners. Before many people own their own home, they rent. However, renting prices have significantly skyrocketed over the last four years, making it hard for young people to move out of their parents' home and start a life of their own. If you're a Gen Zer or a millennial looking to take the next steps towards renting or home ownership, today's podcast will be beneficial for you. Today, I'll be joined by one of Navicor's housing counselors, Stacey Rillo. Stacy and I will be discussing how your credit impacts your ability to rent, rising inflation, how to incorporate rent into your budget, and much more. Now let's get to my interview with Stacy. Hi Stacy, thanks for joining me on the podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. So June is home ownership month. So we're going to be touching on that today. We're going to be talking about the current state of renting in America and then what rent, what, how renters who want to become homeowners, what they should do. So let's get into it. Rental prices rose 22% from December 2019 to December 2023. How does this change in price affect millennials and Gen Zers currently looking to rent? Well, I, I think that this is definitely a challenge for you know, these generations, right? And and what mm-hmm. they might be trying to accomplish when it comes to independence. So I think what I see um, the trends in helping my clients prepare from, let's say, renters to homeownership, many of them need multiple sources of income to be able to sustain that independence. Uh, that is what I'm seeing right now. And that's, that's honestly so crazy because it never used to be like that. Like one job used to be enough, but Mm -hmm. (laughs) it's just not, it's not like that. And it's so unfortunate because young people have always been excited to move out of their parents' house and rent a place of their own. So how do they know when they have enough save to actually move out? You know, that's a great question. I really think that's going to depend on like where they are geography wise, right? Mm -hmm. So we know that the cost of living has gone up across the board, you know, throughout the United States, but the cost of living is going to vary too, depending on where you are. So if we're like thinking of the Northeast, right, I might say, well, for the tri-state area, you might need to save a little bit more than somebody that's in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. So that's where I think geography is going to be a huge part of that. And then also the goal, right? Are they looking for just like a really small starter place? Or are they looking for like their forever family home? That's going to make a difference on what essentially they're going to need to prepare for not only with transitioning, but sustainability. So that is really an open-ended question. It's going to depend on the goal, obviously the resources, right? The income, and then the geography behind it. Because what's the cost of living in that area? Right. You definitely have to take that into consideration. And I actually had Grant Gallagher on the podcast from Affinity Federal Credit Union a few months ago. And we kind of talked about this interest rates. And it is obviously super expensive to live in the Northeast. So it does just depend where you your geography too. So what personal documents do you need to rent? Um, I would say that having a good credit history, like established traditionally, if possible, you know, having a a credit card or, you know, some type of loan established on credit. I think that that is an essential piece, like when I'm thinking of document, because that's Mm -hmm. something that they're looking at. And then you're going to need an identification, Mm -hmm. like a driver's license or some type of form of ID, passport. And a lot of times, too, they may even ask for non-traditional credits. So let's say that you don't have established credit or, again, you're still going to need that ID. They're going to ask for bank statements, very similar documents to what a mortgage application may ask for, maybe just not as many documents. Mm -hmm. So in my experience in being a renter, they ask for bank statements, ID, and proof of income like right. recent pay stubs. And you mentioned credit history. So how does that credit history and your credit score impact your ability to rent? 
most landlords and management companies do want to see an average FICO score. And depending on if there was a previous bankruptcy, sometimes they require a waiting period just as a mortgage would. So I think that's all going to depend on the management company. Most of them do want to see a 620 FICO score. I do believe that the landlords and management companies are still using a consumer type of model where the mortgage uh, model is a little different. Different. They're using an older version of FICO, where the consumer model is like a newer version. So that could be to the renter's advantage, because the consumer model is just higher than the mortgage model. Right. Easiest way for me to say that. So hey, what if you are a young, a Gen Zer, and you don't really have a credit history or anything? Could you have like a co-signer and you wanted to move out? How would that work for someone? You likely could. Again, I think it's going to be case by case scenario. Right. But yes, they will they will allow for like a co-signer to secure that that like, I guess, payment a little bit more. Right? right. To say, OK, well, if you don't have that traditional kind of credit, is somebody willing to to back you up on that? Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, I have seen that happen where a parent. But then, you know, remember that that parent is going to have to provide those documents yeah. or that friend or partner, if you will. And also be aware that if for whatever reason this person cannot pay their rent, you know, the management company or landlord, they're going to be coming to seek that payment from them. So you definitely would have to keep that in mind if you're looking to have a co-signer. And if you want to be a co-signer, keep that in mind. Absolutely. What qualities in a rental should you look for when searching for a potential rental property as a new renter? Well, me being a pet lover, I want to know if they take my dog or cat <laughs> right. or parrot or That's fish, true. whatever mm -hmm. I may want mm -hmm. as like a part of my family, right? <laughs> so, right. <laughs> Well, I think it's going to depend on what the person is looking for, right? Do, are they looking for amenities like a gym, right? Or mm -hmm. a door person? Wouldn't it be so nice to have somebody letting you in your property, right? And a locked mm -hmm. door. Right. So, you know, most of them do have certainly locked doors, but not like a door person. With that being said, I think, again, what amenities are you looking for? And also location, right. I think, is key, right? Meaning, do I want to commune an hour to work if I don't need to? And I can be, you know, within 15 minutes, you know, with traffic. So I think location is huge for anybody looking to purchase. And, you know, then there's going to be other, you know, goals outside of that with location. But I always think about keeping my cost of living down, meaning living below my means so that I can live a better life. So then I'm always going to think of like, how can I make it convenient for myself and how I'm supporting my life with my employment? Mm -hmm. Like that's a big part of my goal that I want to make it easier for me to pay the bills. I don't want to commute my whole life if I don't need to. I, again, I think it's going to come down to personal choice. Some people are fine with like commuting two hours right. a day. Like they're just so used to it. It's just a part of their thing. They work on the train or the bus, whatever they're on, and it works for them. So again, a lot of this comes down to personal choice, like how hard we're willing to work to accomplish these goals because each apartment or landlord is going to have different amenities there, right? Some more limited than others. You know, the less we pay, the more limited right. the amenities. Mm -hmm. And then the more space you want or the more amenities, the more you're just going to pay for it for convenience. Right. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up location because I was kind of going to um, bounce off that. Do you think that some people maybe compromise on location because of price? Like at what point? Is... Absolutely. I'm one yeah. of them. <laughs> right. <laughs> Absolutely. I had to move to a different county because I just yeah. like, yeah, I could have qualified to purchase in the county I grew up in. But guess what? I would have been house poor. Mm -hmm. I would have had no money for anything. And mm -hmm. now, you know, I don't want to work a second job if I don't have to. Again, I yes, I absolutely moved to an area that I never thought I would live in. I am definitely happy that I made the move, but it is sacrifice because mm -hmm. I am a little bit further away from some family members, not not so much others. Others are near me too now, which is nice. We're all kind of in the same area. And that's what I wanted to be near friends, family, and employment. That right. was important for me. You Sometimes inflation can also be affecting our whole life and where we're living and everything. So how does rising inflation affect those looking to rent? I think they have to really look at what they're willing to sacrifice and what they're not mm -hmm. with the bigger responsibility. So for example, like I cut cable, I went to a prepaid cell phone. I mean, I know it sounds silly, but you know, some people, 
I know that especially in certain generations, like they're like cable, <laughs> you know, like it's not even a part <laughs> of their language. But I think again, maybe it comes down to two, like maybe some people go to the beauty salon on the regular or barber shop, mm-hmm. right? And maybe they start to think about how much that costs for that type of you know, self-care, right? Not saying that that, that's not important, but there are ways to adjust, I think, our lifestyles Mm -hmm. to hopefully help that become achievable. But again, it comes down to where do they want to live? Yeah. And yeah, I was going to say that too. I was going to say, you know, many renters are cutting back on the hair salon or, you know, uh, self-care things, any extra Mm -hmm. person purchases or like we've talked about earlier, they're taking a second job to pay their rent. Is this sustainable forever? Well, the future, I think, looks like that there's going to just be, I would think, more partnerships. I mean, that's all I can predict Mm -hmm. for survival outside of just people working multiple jobs. I mean, I have plenty of clients that are single, working parents, that they co-parent, most of them, some of them don't, some of them are single and they're doing it and they're working two jobs Mm -hmm. and they're going for a degree. I don't even know how some of them are doing it. In fact, Mm -hmm. I asked them if they're sleeping because some of them are working two jobs and going to school Mm -hmm. and they're raising kids as a single person. Those people are, they're hustlers. That's Mm -hmm. the easiest way for me to say that. They're driving Lyft and Uber when they can. And I guess we can thank America for creating modern convenience too, or keeping it going or allowing these different ways for people to earn income and allowing other people to have the convenience of paying for it, whether it's DoorDash, Instacart, Lyft, Uber, that's what my clients are doing most likely, Uh, or they're doing a business on the side, baking, cooking, things like that. A lot of my clients do that too. Yeah, it's so crazy. There are just so many more opportunities for side hustles that can be flexible. Like it's not necessarily, oh, I work a full time job here and then I have to go work at uh, a waitress, a certain schedule. Like you can have such a flexible side hustle these days. Yeah. And it could be something you actually really like to do. You Absolutely. Some things see that being making it easier for people if they if they needed a side, side hustle. Renting can give you greater freedom to move and more financial flexibility. What are some other benefits of renting? I know when I was a renter, I liked that I just didn't have to keep up with the property, Mm -hmm. you know, outside of just like obviously respecting it, taking (laughs) care of it. But, you know, I didn't have to like replace the floor or like if the toilet went, luckily, I just would call the landlord and they would take care of it. You know, so I liked not having that financial obligation and then also having the flexibility of not having to stay there anymore if I didn't want to once my lease was expired. I mean, I was month to month for such a long time. So I think not having that commitment was mm-hmm. just huge for me. And I felt like I was more free to just leave instead of like with, you know, a lease you might be tied into But I think, again, being a renter, even tying into a year lease, it's such a short period Um, where a mortgage is more so 30 years usually when you're getting into the property of purchase. I mean, some people take out a lesser term, but usually they're trying to stretch that payment out, which is why they take that 30-year term. So a 30-year term on a mortgage is much different than a one-year lease on a rental, even if you're not month to month. And I think for a lot of young people, that one year is just, it makes them feel free. Like they're like, oh, well, I don't know where I'm going to be in five years. Why, why buy or something? They like that flexibility and they might be able to live in a neighborhood they couldn't afford to otherwise too. I think that might be appealing for young people these days. And, you know, you also, you don't actually, you don't have to pay property taxes when you rent either. There's a lot of financial considerations to take in. Absolutely. Currently, what percentage of your income should you be spending on rent? Ah, well, (laughs) (laughs) it's probably depending on like what financial um, resource you're asking, right? Mm -hmm, Right. (laughs) So, I mean, remember what I said earlier, I like when we live below our means so that there's more wiggle room. Guess what? If I maxed out on my buying power seven years ago, I'd be in real big trouble right now. So I'm always going to say to somebody, if they're paid like biweekly, Try not to have that payment take up more than one of those paychecks. Try to keep it below that so that you got a few hundred extra dollars Mm -hmm. to live off of till the next paycheck. I mean, listen, some people are making an income where 
you know, we might not need to have this conversation. They already know to buy below their means. But the people that are moderate to working class, again, unless you have some kind of side hustle, whether you're documenting it or not, you have to be very careful because rent is going to go up. Utilities are going to go up if that's outside of the rent payment. You know, sometimes it is, sometimes Mm -hmm. it isn't. And the cost of living is just going to continue to go up. Mm -hmm. So you have to think of, too, am I in a business where my pay is going to keep up with that likely? And then also, how hard am I willing to work to just make a housing payment? Mm -hmm. You know, again, this is kind of a question with a question. I wish I had an exact answer. Like me, I would love it for to be 20%. Is that realistic? Maybe not. I think the rule is 30%. Well, I know it is. You know, the rule is... 28 to 31 percent, I guess, if you want to get technical of the gross monthly wages. But again, we're talking gross monthly wages. We see our net income to pay our bills. I'm always going to look at the net to be like, wait a minute, like, like, what are you doing? Like, I have some people buying a house, believe it or not, and their mortgage payment is more than one of their biweekly paychecks. Uh, And we talk about that. I mean, I think that's a good rule of thumb now that I'm thinking about is the less than one of your paychecks if you're paid biweekly. It's a good, I mean, that's a good rule of thumb to start for people if they're looking to. How can a young person incorporate rent into their budget when they might already have other debts? My goal for the client would be to try to be as financial independent going into a new responsibility for Mm -hmm. renting, let's say the new responsibility. Uh, Because you still want to have that security deposit saved. You know, some some landlords are requiring like two months in advance instead of like a month and a half like they used to in the past. If you can avoid going in with unsecured debts, that's ideal, meaning credit cards. Try to budget to have those paid off. If we're talking a car loan, well, I want to know how much that payment is. I want to know what the interest rate is. Does the refinance look like a viable solution to lower the payment before going into renting. You know, so I'm always going to look at kind of those individual debts. Are you are you a student? Do you have student loan debt where right. you don't require repayment or maybe you do? And I want to know about that. So what kind of debt is it? But if it's unsecured like credit cards, I would always recommend Oh, please pay those off beforehand. I was no going to say, if you don't, if you have the student loan debt, thinking about that, like don't not pay your student loan bills to, to, you know, try to rent in a super nice place. You know what I mean? Like you have to consider that. Oh yeah. You have to consider your other financial responsibilities. Yeah. So meaning rent is going to be that priority. And, and I'd like to think keeping your credit on time is also going to be a priority. So absolutely. There's going to be priority and living expenses, Um, You know, as a housing counselor, we're always going to focus on housing first, but I'm also going to say, hey, what can you do to make it easier for you for the transition, I guess? Maybe that's Mm -hmm. how I understood it. Yeah, right. I mean, like like when new renters want to rent, maybe they should just they should really look at all their finances before they sign that lease and see how it's going to affect their financial future. Do a budget. Do a budget. Again, Mm -hmm. what's important to you? What isn't? You know, I'll say to people, hey. Don't think about just a survival budget. Think about your wants. Like what's important to you? Do you celebrate holidays? Do you like to go on vacation? Do you have a hobby? You know, I I like crafts. Guess what? Michael's costs me money. (laughs) Yeah, I like animals. Guess what? That costs me money. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So things like that are are maybe my want. And Mm -hmm. and again, where does it fit in to my with my need, you know, if I, if I need to get my own place, let's say, and I want to get my own place, what am I willing to sacrifice? It comes, it comes down to that question again. You're currently renting. What resources are available to you if you're struggling to pay that rent? Well, I would always say to go to HUD.gov and just find a local housing counselor that's going to be in your area. We are national, so you can absolutely go to navacoresolutions.org and you can reach out to one of our housing counselors. You know, sometimes we have the ability to provide in-house resources for rental assistance. Sometimes we have to refer the clients out elsewhere to see if there's funding available in their area. So a HUD certified housing counselor can help with that. And and we have them here. Yeah. And I'll make sure to link HUD in the description of this podcast so anyone can get that there. And Navicor is always linked in the description. So if you're exactly. looking for that help, well, you can get it there. How do you know when you're ready to step away from renting and become a homeowner? 
Ah, <laughs> once you once you've hopefully taken at least one home ownership counseling course, whether it's online <laughs> and in person workshop over the phone. Yeah, I think again, just really, I, I like to tell people too, it's never too early to prepare. I mean, go to your housing mortgage and finance agency website. Each state has one. And I bet you they have some kind of free home ownership um, checklist link so that you can weigh out the pros and the cons. I think that's really the key. You've got to make a good old fashioned pros and cons list to identifying if you're prepared for it. Mm -hmm. And then in the meantime, if not, taking those action steps that are realistic for you, your resources, hopefully your timing, and then preparing from there. I mean, it takes some of my clients two years to prepare. It takes others five years. If you're currently renting but want to become a homeowner, how can you save for that down payment while you're still paying rent? Well, depending on your income, you might be eligible for a grant program that mm -hmm. could be forgivable. Some of them are recoverable. Some of them are rec like a recouped, others forgivable. It's going to be based on income family size. So there are programs that range from 80% of the area median income to 140% of the area median income. So that's where it will open it up more for like above low income. I would say, again, talking to a housing counselor could be key to help you identify where you might be in that income bracket because you might have to save less than you think. If you're open to using a grant, how should someone prepare for the differences of becoming a homeowner versus renting? Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to come down to like what their goals are. So meaning, is this a short term purchase that you want to make a long term purchase? Same thing with the rental, right? Mm -hmm. Like, where do I see myself in five years? Or do I just want to take it from year to year? And I'm okay with that. So I, I think those are the differences, right? What are my goals when it comes to planting roots versus more flexibility? I think that's a, a huge part of it. And then I think too, looking at the overall cost of living, like in the area where you want to reside. And I think that's really going to help you identify how much you want to have left over, let's say after closing or even after signing up for a lease. I know plenty of clients that want to have money in the bank after signing a lease for a rental because they want to make sure that they can pay that rent if they lose their job. There's plenty of um, you know, consumers that prepare that way, especially if let's say they have the ability to live at home and not have to pay rent. I was also going to say like maybe I always recommend having an emergency fund, but I think especially when you're a homeowner because things break and it's on you to fix it. It's not on your landlord to fix it and stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. so keep that emergency fund. Definitely uh, start with three months and then work your way up to six months worth of living. Stacey, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today and highlighting Home Ownership Month. Um, it was great talking to you. Yes, yeah, same. Thank you so much for having me. And I appreciate your time as well, Katie. Thank you. <laughs> If you're looking to rent or purchase a home, there are many different factors that can impact your ability to do so. Before you rent or buy, think about what's important to you and what amenities you'd like near where you live. It's important to incorporate your rent in your budget so you don't find yourself behind on paying your student loan payments. If you're currently renting and you're struggling to pay your rent, reach out to a Navicor certified housing counselor. They'll be able to provide you with the resources you need and help guide you while you're struggling. With that being said, that wraps up another episode of Millennial Debt Domination. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening. And if you're listening on Spotify or Apple Podcasts, please rate and review us there. I'll talk to you next time, millennials, Gen Zers, and everyone else listening. Bye.